Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... This weekend, I'm reviewing the novelization of Man Board by Brett Nelson, which was recently released on ebook and print last Friday. And for those who are unfamiliar with this title, it was inspired by the movie of the same name by Stephen Kostansky. Now, to be honest, this is a book that falls into a subgenre that I normally don't read, as I'm not a huge fan of futuristic sci fi horror. However, the opportunity arose for me to read an advanced reader's copy of this, so I checked out the synopsis and saw that it had a lot of really cool horror elements to it, and I decided this would be a good opportunity for me to broaden my horizons. And even though I had never seen Man Borg, I decided to read the book before watching the movie, despite that this was actually a novelization. Also, as a side note, this book will always have a special memory tied to it for me because I had read it while I was on a weekend getaway with my husband and mother-in-law as we had spent Memorial Day weekend on Pensacola Beach. And if you're the kind of person who likes to coordinate what you read with a certain time of year, then Man Borg is totally suitable to read for like Memorial Day weekend or Veterans Day or anything like that. And it's just the subject matter itself that really feels like it would be suitable for those holidays. But anywho, without me rambling on, let's go back in time to the 80s and 90s and see what our world might would have been like if all hell had broken loose. Man Borg by Brett Nelson opens up in 1987 and presents a scenario called the Hell Wars, where one day Earth has split open and has regurgitated all of Hell's abominations. Then, within 72 hours after Hell has gained dominion, a new leader rises by the name of Count Draculon. And even though a good portion of the world's population has been slaughtered, he leaves enough people alive so they can build hell on Earth and serve as a blood supply for him and his brethren. From here, people who have decided to comply are expected to frequently give blood so they can live in this new dystopia. Yet, there are still people who rebel against Count Draculon, which this brings us to a set of brothers named Mike and Wayne who have dedicated themselves to rescuing people and bringing them to safety. But one day after they're ambushed by Count Draculon, both brothers are killed by him and his minions. And even though Count Draculon thinks these brothers are history, a mysterious figure takes Mike's dead body and upgrades it with man-made technology as well as technology that is known as Helltech. Then, after he has modified Mike's body into a cyborg, he sets a timer for Mike to wake up after 10 years. Then, once a decade passes, Manborg wakes up and encounters a character by the name of Number One Man, who has escaped Count Draculon's headquarters, which is known as Genesis Tower. And even though Manborg and Number One Man get captured and are brought to the tower, an uprise is soon to occur because while Man Borg has been placed in this prison, he gets to know two other prisoners who are a sibling couple by the names of Justice and Mina. Now, after they've had the chance to speak and get to know each other a little bit, Man Borg, Number One Man, Mina, and Justice all team up so they can take down Count Draculon. Since I received an advanced reader's copy of Manborg, I also had the opportunity to ask the author Brett Nelson a few interview questions. And since he was kind enough to respond, here are his answers. Question number one. What was it like adapting a movie into a novelization? For example, what were the steps you took in the creating process? Mr. Nelson replied, this was a lot of fun. 
there were many monsters and gadgets and weapons that didn't have names or detailed operations, so I got to make a lot of that up. That's like candy to me. The process, well, I started with the movie and the screenplay. They were a dab different from each other. They always are. For instance, in the script, the Baron didn't have a crush on Mina, and in the script, Count Draculon had a much bigger transformation during the final boss fight. Steve Kostansky was nice enough to give me lots of answers when I had questions while I was prepping. He also gave me lots of freedom to extend the world past the edges of the frame, more character development, greater detail on the war, and what life is like now for the survivors. He was great. Finally, you can take all of those bits and hammer out a first draft. It's like making popcorn in a big pot on the stove. You put in the grease and tiny bits, put on the lid, crank the heat, and wait. Then comes a single clang, then a pop, then a few more, and then an onslaught of noise and heat and movement, and if you're lucky, the lid flies off. Question number two. Were you a fan of the Man Borg movie prior to writing the novelization? Mr. Nelson replied, I saw Psycho Gorman first and liked it so much. Then Mark Miller, the book's publisher, asked if I had seen Man Borg. Since Gorman blew me away, I hadn't, so I watched it and was nuts for it. And how could he not be a fan? So much love and talent went into Man Borg. It's in every frame. Question number three. Between the film and book, how much creative freedom did you have with the novelization? Mr. Nelson replied, Steve created a world that was bigger than what he could fit into a movie, and that makes the movie work knowing that the story happens across a big timeline in a big place. I had asked a few questions early on, like how do the day-to-day -day lives of humans in Magnet City work, and how were those of Terra Opticon battles ranked? Also, about Man Borg's past with his brother. Side note, they didn't have names in the movie. Steve helped with all of that. But once I started writing, there were no interim check-ins. I got to go all the way to the end before I handed it back for notes. And there were four notes. So, yeah, everyone was very kind. Question number four. How does your other stories compare with the style of Man Borg? How are they different? Mr. Nelson replied, That's a toughie. I've written gothic horror and modern stories about witches. I've also done a lot of children's television and dark fables and pulp fiction. Everything is different, but hopefully you can hear a little bit of my voice in each. Oh, this is the first thing I've done with the chase scene. I've done fights and characters escaping out of traps, but this is the first vehicle chase. That was fun. Question number five. How can fans contact you? Mr. Nelson replied, You can find the publisher and Psychopocalypse publications at their website, www.encycopocalypse.com, and there you'll find links to all of the socials. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the answers that we received. I really appreciate Mr. Nelson taking time out of his day to answer those. And if you would like to contact Mr. Nelson or check out a little bit more of the publishing house in Psychopocalypse, then I have included a link to that website in the description section of this episode, so be sure to check it out. And I really do urge for you to check out the publisher site because they've been releasing a lot of really cool stuff. A lot of it is new, but then we also have a lot of books that have been out of print. Like they do tons of novelizations, bringing back horror classics, and it's just a good opportunity that they've provided for the consumers. So definitely check them out. But Anywho, now it's time for me to move on to the spoiler section of this episode, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So, if you would like to click away, just scroll down to the comments and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top. In that comment is a timestamp. Once you click that timestamp, it will direct you away from the spoilers and bring you to the thoughts section. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go!
Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few of my favorite moments. First up is when Manborg awakens. Now, at this point, the world has undergone a lot of changes because it's been taken over by a totalitarian government who constantly reminds its people to obey. And while this character by the name of Robert is on the run because he owes a few liters of blood, Manborg awakens from this crate that he had been stored in. Then, after Manborg emerges from the sewer, he intends to help Robert, who has now been captured. But instead of going to help him, he's distracted by Number One Man, who explains that he doesn't need to get involved. Also, Manborg's sensors aren't all up and running, so instead of him trying to play hero, he just goes off to the side with Number One Man. But, of course, while he and Number One Man are talking, they are confronted by a Killborg and this really kick-ass shapeshifter known as Shadow Mega. And even though they're able to hold their own for a little bit, they eventually get captured and brought to Genesis Tower. Aside from the character interaction and how fast-paced everything was here, I really love the creativity that went into the Manborg character, especially with all of the functions and gadgets that he had been upgraded with. And even though at this point he wasn't able to use all of his weapons because they were offline, it really built up my anticipation for when he would be able to use these weapons to his full potential. Next up is the arena battle scene, which after Manborg is taken to his cell, Justice, Mina, Number One Man, and himself are summoned to battle in the arena with a handful of other prisoners. Then, once they get into the arena, Kilborgs attack with the intent that they battle to the death. And while everyone is dying around this group of heroes, the heroes themselves are holding their own pretty well and killing everything that attacks them. But midway into their fight, a huge Kilborg steps onto scene with the intent to kill off the survivors. However, Manborg's arm turns into a barrel and takes the creature down by a storm of bolts. Above all else, I really enjoyed this moment because it felt like an old-school gladiator fight that had been updated with technology. So that was pretty cool to see, and it's something that I had not seen before, which that could possibly be because I've not just really dove into this subgenre. But for those who are into high action sequences, this is one of those moments where the punches, stabbings, shootings, movements, they all go full throttle. My final favorite moment was Draculon's death. So prior to this, Manborg, Justice, and Number One Man return to Genesis Tower to rescue Mina. And once they arrive, they decide to split up where Manborg takes the elevator to confront Draculon. Then, once they are confronting one another, Manborg gets thrown out of the observation deck and lands into the arena, where Draculon shortly there follows where they have a battle to the death. And since Draculon is like boss level, Manborg pulls out all of the stops and he goes as hardcore as he can until his gears have no other choice but to cool down. And since those are cooling down, he uses his final option, which is by him engaging this blade from his arm. And as soon as he does that, Draculon extends a much larger blade. Meanwhile, as they're in battle, we have where Justice, Mina, and Number One Man have successfully killed Shadow Mega and the Baron. Then, after Mina, Justice, and Number One Man go to the arena to see what's up, they discover that the guards have left their post, and Mina decides that she's going to run in and try to help Manborg, which she ends up getting killed in the process, but Manborg is able to bring her back. And while all of this is going down, Manborg is able to actually behead Draculon, and once Draculon falls and dies, Genesis Tower begins to crumble. This was a pretty epic battle, and since the scenes kept swapping back and forth between characters, this was filled with nothing but pure action. 
Also, it was kind of sad to see Manborg wind down after he killed Draculon, but at the same time, that was replaced with some quirkiness, because as he's winding down, he sees a hologram of his older brother who says there is no heaven. Which, this is kind of humorous, because at the beginning of the book, Draculon explains that they aren't at war with heaven, because heaven doesn't have anything that they want. So, this dig that the older brother had with the little brother, and just that whole dynamic there, it provided the comedic relief that we needed at this point. I would like to take this opportunity to bitch about the Baron, because even though he had a few humorous moments, he was a number one smug son of a bitch. Like, for example, and this is one of those cases where we're not laughing with you, we're laughing at you, but he had told everyone that he had quit smoking, but he's still sneaking cigarettes, and every time he gets busted, someone reminds him that, hey, didn't you say you had quit smoking? Which, this just burns his ass. Then he has that whole awkward side to him where he wants to date Mina, but she doesn't want his befugly Minuteman self, so that just pisses him off even more. Aside from his quirky human qualities, the Baron truly is a smug son of a bitch, though. Which, I mean, he is a blood-sucking demon from hell, so we can't exactly expect a Bob Ross personality. But to give an example of his smugness, the scene at the end where the Baron is acting all superior because he claims that he upgraded and Number One Man is no match for him or anything like that, Number One Man still catches him off of his guard and kicks his wrinkly old ass into a power circuit where he explodes. And when this happened, all I could think was, that's what you get, you shit for brains. Manborg by Brett Nelson was an entertaining breed that was full of imagination while it presented characters who were fun and likable. Aside from that, I noticed where this book focused on blood-sucking politics as well as a society being forced to obey a renegade government. Character-wise, I really love how the brothers Mike and Wayne interacted because it felt like even though they could nag at one another and get on each other's nerves and stuff like that, at the end of the day, it really felt like they understood that they shared an unconditional brotherly love. Aside from them, I was really surprised to see that the villains, especially the Baron, had some campiness and humor to them. Also, because of how the character development is constructed, and this is not a complaint whatsoever, so please don't think that it is, but the characters in this book and movie actually felt like they were heavily inspired by anime. So I got some very strong anime vibes there, which is kind of weird because I'm really not into anime whatsoever, but for people who are, I think that the characters will hit very hard for them. Theme-wise, this book is fairly political as it focuses on a communistic uprise that dominates the world which this is not only seen by Hell's actions, but how the handful of people who are left alive are given the ultimatum to comply or die. And similar to insurance or paying taxes, those who choose to comply are expected to constantly give leaders of blood so they and their family can attempt to survive in this world that has completely gone to hell. Meanwhile, the powers that be aren't really doing anything in their favor except just sparing them another day. Also, adding on to that, not only does this book show us what it's like to be under a totalitarian government, but I believe it comments on greedy corporations as well. Which, I could be wrong about that, but it's just what I read into as I was reading the book. And the reason why I think this is because with Genesis Tower, it's really the pinnacle of everything. And that's where we get all of our information and all of the orders and stuff like that. It's almost like this one-stop place for everything. 
So that's kind of why I drew that conclusion. And even though this book is political, it isn't heavy-handed like classics such as 1984. Then, opposing the actions of the totalitarian government, we have the rebels who rise up, like Justice, Mina, Number One Man, and Manborg. And because of how strongly they stand together, we see that there is power in numbers, and no matter how big or small that group is, it can start a revolution. Overall, Manborg didn't scare me, creep me out, or gross me out. And normally, this isn't the type of book that I gravitate to. However, I'm really glad that I accepted the advanced reader's copy because it kept me entertained. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, as long as I'm entertained, then the book, movie, whatever, did its job. Manborg by Brett Nelson is an action-packed novelization that's full of vampiric demons, creatures, cyborgs, and the list continues. Also, if you're looking for a quick and easy read, this is something that you can knock out over the total of the weekend, especially since I was able to read this while I was vacationing with family for Memorial Day, and I not only had time to read this in its entirety, but I still had time to spend with my family and sightsee. So yeah, very quick read. But at the end of the day, if you are looking for a high action book that really blends the genres of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror, and you're looking to be able to kick back with something with a bag of popcorn, then I do recommend Manborg. Well, now that it's time to close out my video, I would like to thank these awesome people for contributing to my Patreon account. As you can tell, some of the names listed here are creators, so be sure to check out their work. And if you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, just go to the description section of this episode and you'll see that I have a link provided. Once clicking on that link, you'll see that I have two tier options available one of which is $5 a month, which will give you a shout out at the end of my videos like what you see here. And if there is a certain profession you would like for me to tie to your name, just let me know and I will include that as well. The second tier I have is for $10 a month and you'll still receive the shout out at the end of my videos, but I do creepy photography on the side. So at the beginning of every month, I'll send you over one of my creepy photos. From there, you can print it off, do whatever you like. So if you're able to do this, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. I just hope you return to this channel so we can have a good time together. Also, if you would like to hit me up on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all available in the description section of this episode. And if you have not subscribed to this channel, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.